on the foreign policy stuff. Um, so the the questions that I have mm -hmm. with regard to to Biden on foreign policy, uh, very very simple question: mm -hmm. Do you think that the situation in the Middle East is better now than it was under Donald Trump? Mm. Probably, um, that's a hard one. The factors Why? that I'm making right now are uh, like, obviously you've got the Israel-Palestinian war that's going on right now, which is kind of bad, but like broadly speaking, I'm not sure how much that affects the Middle East as much as like the collapse of Syria. 2013 Syrian civil war sent millions of immigrants throughout all of Europe. Which that, was under? Um, which was under Obama and continued right. under Trump. Trump didn't do anything to alleviate any of the Syrian civil war. Um, in term, like, why did Syria end up as a preserve of Russia again? <clears throat> How did Syria end up as a preserve of Russia? Yes, why did it end up being essentially a client state of Russia? Um, I know that Putin enjoys access to the ports down there. Um, I don't know. You it, I mean, the reason is because Barack Obama suggested that there was a red line that would be drawn in the face of chemical weapons use. Bashar Assad then used chemical sure. weapons in Syria, and Barack Obama was un unwilling to then essentially create consequences for Syria in the form of any sort of Western strike. And so instead he outsourced it to Russia. This is 2013, 2014. <clears throat> sure. Right? Do you so think they, there might've been some hesitancy after like seeing how Libya ended up that maybe us like intervening? Who, who was hardcore? president during Libya? Uh, Obama. Yeah. I mean, like, so the, the, sure, but, the, but, but what does that have to do with anything though? I'm just I mean, saying no, the, like, the, there might've been like a mistake learned. The point that, that I'm making like, is our... that actually the Middle East, I mean, just historically speaking, was historically good under Donald Trump. I mean, it's very difficult to make the case that either before or after Trump were better than during Donald Trump. Was like, it, this I is mean, of, the yes. Syrian, I don't think that, that Trump contributed to the Syrian situation in improving much. Um, I well, think I mean, he, he, did a lot of, he did wreck ISIS, which was in the- I mean, ISIS had been East getting wrecked by the Kurds in Iraq, by every single person, by uh, Assad's there's army, by Putin, by Turkey, literally everybody was fighting against ISIS at that point. The, 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 there was a spike in violence, and then the, mm -hmm. the Trump, I mean, you get credit for when you're president, presumably. I mean- Things got better with ISIS under Trump. I mean, yeah, they did. I mean, things, things got worse were, with ISIS under Obama. They, for sure. He called them the JV that. squad. Sure. And then they became not the JV squad. Yeah, but and I don't know if ISIS is originating in Syria um, and uh, Baghdadi and all of the growth of that is necessarily Obama's fault. I know that we like to say that Obama created ISIS. I don't know if you say that, but I've heard that saying a lot. I think that's a little bit simplistic. Um, I, I don't think that when, sure. when I'm looking at like actions that presidents have taken, the the Big, the biggest criticism I have for like Middle Eastern policy is I think the Doha Accords were a disaster. And I think that's like one of the biggest blemishes that we have right now. I would also argue that moving the um, embassy to Jerusalem was also kind of silly um, and arguably contributed to some of the conflict we see right now. No, between exactly. Israel and Palestine. I'll, I'll argue precisely the opposite, especially given the fact that after the movement of the embassy to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. the Abraham Accords continued to sign and actually expand. And that if Donald Trump had been elected, I have no doubt in my mind that Saudi Arabia would now be a part of the Abraham Accords. In fact, that was basically pre-negotiated. Uh, and then when Joe Biden took office, Joe Biden took a very anti-Saudi stance on a wide variety of issues. The, the biggest single effect in the Middle East of Joe Biden's presidency, and again, I agree with you that not every foreign policy issue can be laid at the hands of a president. Joe Biden's main approach to the Middle East was very similar to the Obama approach, which is why the Middle East was chaotic under Obama and chaotic under Biden. And that was to alienate allies like Saudi Arabia and Israel, and instead to try to make common cause or cut deals with Iran. What that did is incentivize terrorism from Iran. What we're watching in the Middle East is Iran attempting to use every one of its terror proxies in the Middle East, and it was specifically launched in an attempt to avoid what Biden actually was trying to do, which was good, which was after two years of failure with Saudi Arabia, try to bring them into the Abraham Accords, right? That was what was burgeoning at the end of, la at the end of last year. And Iran saw that, and Iran decided that they were going to throw a grenade into the middle of those negotiations mm -hmm. by essentially activating Hamas. Hamas activates, Hamas commits October 7th. Israel, as a sovereign nation state, has to respond to the murder of 1,200 of its citizens and the taken kidnapping of, of 240. Israel has to do that not only to go after its own hostages and try to restore them, but also to reestablish military deterrence in the most violent region of the world. Hezbollah gets active on Israel's northern border. Hezbollah is an Iranian proxy. They get active on the northern border. The The... Houthis in Yemen get active. These are all, the only reason all this is happening at it's the same time is because Iran is doing this, right? Mm -hmm. And but I, not but just that, they're, they're, they're threatening global shipping. Sure. If you're talking about the effects of global supply lines, which I totally agree had mm -hmm. a major inflationary effect on the economy thanks to COVID, mm -hmm. right now, the cost of shipping is nearly double what it was just a few weeks ago. And that is because a ragtag group of who the barbarians are attacking international shipping and forcing everybody to stop using the Babel Mandibs freight instead going around the Cape of Good Hope sure. in, in Africa. 
All of that is the result of the fact that Joe Biden reoriented the United States in the very early days in favor of a more pro-Iranian stance. He appointed Robert Malley to negotiate the Iran deal, who, as it turns out, was using proxies. He, many of his aides were actually war- taking money from Iran. Ra- the, the, the Biden administration, literally one of their first acts was to delist the Houthis as a terror organization and end sanctions against the Houthis. You know, these are all moves that, that Biden made very early on. They were disastrous moves. But when it comes to domestic policy, I think he hasn't been nearly as damaged wait, wait, as wait, domestic wait, policy on, as he has been on foreign policy. Sure, sure. So just on a couple of Middle Eastern things. So one of the big things that threw the Middle East into disaster was what we are all traumatized by it now, was the Iraq evasion, which I'm not a Republican president. Sure. You agree with that, right? Sure. Yes. The, d- the deposition of Saddam Hussein and everything that followed after probably contributed more to the growth of ISIS and the destabilization of that entire region, probably more than anything else. I think that under pr- prior to Bush, um, for Clinton, and even at the beginning of Bush's presidency, we were on some kind of road to normalcy um, with Iran, which I think has to happen, whether we like them or not, um, until Bush, for whatever reason, decides to throw Iran into the axis of evil. And I need some evidence that we we're on a road to normalcy with Iran in the 1990s. We do in the wait what that we are on a road to normalcy with Iran in the 1990s. I, My I understanding to, is that yeah, from the late 90s and prior to the axis of evil uh, labeling of Iran, that there was going to be some path forward to where we could start to normalize relationships with them. I, I, I find that very difficult to believe, and I don't see a lot of evidence. I mean, we can just disagree on that. Sure, but, okay, but yeah, sure, the, we can disagree on that. But I know that the, once the, they by got the, way, the, 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 the yeah. after effects. Just mm-hmm. quick note: mm-hmm. the after effect of the Iraq War that was the most devastating was the increase in power of Iran. I agree. Yeah, because of the destabilization yes. of Iraq and Iraq not having a uh, a government there that was functional for at least a decade. And was in fact uh, a Sunni government, right? Originally, it was a Sunni government. Disbanding the, the Sunni army was one of the worst things that the Bush Probably, administration yeah, did. Banning all the former Ba'ath parties. All the yes. Yeah, all horrible under a Republican president. Um, but Don't disagree. That the, uh, yeah, that that probably contributed more to ISIS, uh, to the growth of power in Iran, maybe even to the destabilization of Syria, probably more than anything that Obama did. Um, also, the uh, when, when we look at Iran funding people in the region, I don't disagree with that as well. I think Iran is the number one instigator of bad guy things right now in the Middle East. Iran, um, the IRGC, I supported when Donald Trump killed Soleimani. I think that was a great thing. Um, I, I think that Iran is a major problem. However, I don't know if the path forward is constantly being a belligerent to Iran or trying to figure out some road to normalcy. I don't know if the collapse of Iran um, or the destruction of that country, considering how unpopular the Ayatollah even is there, like the citizens of Iran, I don't think are big supporters of the government there. Um, I I feel like moving on a path where, you know, let's do our nuclear inspections. We had that um, Iranian nuclear deal that Trump pulled out of. Let's do the nuclear inspections. Make sure you're not on a way to nuclear weapons. Let's unfreeze some funds. Let's move in some direction where we get on a good term with you. I feel like that's the most important thing that needs to happen in the Middle East. As much as people like to look at the Abraham Accords, who cares if, what what was it? Uh, Bahrain, I think Oman, um, I think UAE, Morocco, the UAE and Morocco. Yeah, are something like all of these people well, even Saudi Arabia already have like de facto normalization with Israel anyway. They're all trading. No, this is, I mean, to, to pretend that, that anybody even 15 years ago would have been talking about normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel is insane. They, I mean, that's, they, that's already, insane. they were already on that path. They, they, in, they had already been trading. They were already de facto a, trading partners well, with each other. That, 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 they had already a, been collaborating that's a, that's and doing That's a things. wild claim that, that Israel and Saudi Arabia were going to normalize 15 years ago. 15 that, years ago might have been a wild claim. That, that's what, that's, but after that, Turkey, um, after Jordan, and then in the past like 20 years of like economic relations and ties with each other, all of the leadership in the Middle East, and you'll agree with this, look at Israel and they go, okay, well, we've got Palestinians who, you know, God bless them do nothing. And then you've got Israel, which is uh, on a on a region with no natural resources to somehow become like an economic giant. They're good to trade with. Their population is educated. They, you know, have military power. Um, all of the leadership in these Middle Eastern countries are wanting to be friendly with Israel and are engaging in trade de facto with Israel. And the idea that like the UAE and Bahrain were brought in <clears throat> to say like, oh, well, now we're going to officially say this. I, I just Those, I were, those were the first steps toward obviously the formation of a new Middle East in which economics would predominate over sectarian conflict. The chief obstacle to that is Iran. I agree. The notion that you, that that negotiations with the Ayatollah were going to be a solution to any of this is but do we think absolutely is, benign. Are, are the, is it the Abraham Accords that's convincing Saudi Arabia to take a stance against Iran? No, I mean, no, Saudi Arabia is going to take... Yeah, they're already fighting with each other, right? Like, no, okay. I don't think the Abraham Accords moved us any closer towards any type of real peace in the region. No, the point what has to happen is something has to happen with Iran. Look, there has to be some diplomatic well, bilateral communication there. N- no, what has to happen is the containment of Iran, which was what was in <clears throat> pra- which was what was taking place with the increased normalization with the Sunni Arab world and Israel combined with significant economic sanctions. The, the, the notion that... that <clears throat> there, there's this far-fetched notion in, in foreign policy circles that mm-hmm. diplomacy can sort of be wish cast out of thin air. That if you sit around a table that you can always come to an agreement with somebody. The Ayatollahs do not have common interests with the United States. They do not. 
and this idea that they are willing to take money in exchange for, for example, some sort of peaceful acquiescence to Israel's existence is obviously untrue. Hasn't They're that literally historically, funny. hasn't that been the case though? That you've had a region with tons of sectarian violence for a long time, and then finally Turkey was like, you know what? This isn't worth it. The United States paid them a lot of money. They had conversations with Israel. And you know what? The, the economy, the economic gains. Well, I mean, the, the, the relation, of, I mean, same thing with Jordan, get, same thing with Syria. Not to get into Turkish Gulf. politics, but, sure, it, yeah. but, but, the, <laughs> um, but, but the, the situation with Turkey was actually quite warm between Israel and Turkey in the 90s when you had the, the you know, sort of secular Muslim regime. In the 90s, of, but they signed Kamal Eastern, Turk in place. And, and, now Erdogan is has joined in the fray, and Erdogan is significantly more radical sure, than what I'm came before. So sorry um, if I said Turkey, I meant Egypt. My bad. Yeah. Well, okay. So Egypt. Yeah. Right. So um, so yeah. So yeah, yeah. in terms of like Egypt and Jordan, right? Were the first two you need big ones. Uh, so you, here's the thing: mm -hmm. you need. Is it possible that you could theoretically come to a deal with Iran only with a new leadership crew? Okay, this is true for every peace agreement in the region. Mm -hmm. You you could not Israel could not have made peace with well they made peace for, with Egypt uh, and, no, and no, no, no. Sadat was the leader for Yom Kippur right he did not make peace with Nasser. Right. Sure. The point is that this is a different regime. You need a different regime. This but is I'm saying the, the same regime that did the part of the Yom Kippur War was the same regime that negotiated peace with Israel. I mean, that's true. Mm -hmm. It is also true that that is a relationship that could be cultivated specifically because it was Sadat who made clear he was going to come to the table. Mm -hmm. Have the Iranians ever made clear that they would come to the table over, for example, the existence of the state of Israel? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a thing that's going to happen. But I think literally, people probably felt proxy, the same. Every, every single one of their proxy groups, every one of them, not only calls for the destruction of the state of Israel, mm -hmm. they also call for the destruction of America. I mean, this is literally the Houthi slogan. They're busy hitting ships, and their slogan is literally, Allahu Akbar, death to America, death to the Jews, death to Israel. It doesn't fit on a bumper sticker, but that, and it's not all that catchy, but that is, in fact, their slogan. The notion that the regime that propagates that is going to be approached with diplomacy is not only wrong, the problem is that we, it's easy to say the stakes of diplomacy are, are okay, well, so we try to talk, right? Jaw, jaw is better than war, war. Sure. The only problem is that in the Middle East, weakness is taken as a sign that aggression might be an appropriate response. That is how things work in the Middle East. And the fact that Barack, uh, that, that Joe Biden, rather, came into office with an orientation toward continuing the Biden, the, the Obama policies in Iran has led to conflagrations, these sort of brush fires breaking out everywhere that Iran has borders with either the West or Israel or both, right? Any place that's happening is leading to brush fires. Because again, the logic of violence in the Middle East is not quite the logic of violence in other places in the world. By the way, I think the logic of violence in the Middle East is actually closer to what most international politics looks like than we than we wish that it were. I mean, I think that's part of what's happening in Ukraine as well. So you right? think which, that which brings me, by the way, here's my question about Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Well, just real quick, around. and then you can yeah, answer this now. So sure. you think that for Iran, right, a country that has been sanctioned for God knows how many years now, you think that for Iran, just continuing to sanction them and contain them is an effective way, is more effective than trying to engage them in bilateral or multilateral peace talks? Yes, so, 100%. Okay. And the proof is in the pudding. Before we go to Ukraine, can I ask about Israel? So you're both mostly in agreement but what is well, I don't know if I'd say that. But. Okay, but <laughs> <laughs> as I'm learning, mm -hmm. uh, what is Israel doing right? What is Israel doing wrong in this very specific current war in Gaza? Um, I mean, frankly, I think that what Israel's doing wrong is if I were Israel, mm -hmm. okay, like, again, America's interests are not coincident with Israel's interests. If, if, if I were an Israeli leader, I would have swiveled up and I would have knocked the bleep out of Hezbollah early. What does, I think that, uh, what does that mean? So I, I would have, I would have, Yoav Gallant, who's the defense minister of Israel, was encouraging Netanyahu, who's the prime minister, and the war cabinet, including Benny Gantz. So whenever people talk about the Netanyahu government, that's not what's in place right now. There's a unity war government in place that includes the political opposition. The reason I point that out is because there are a lot of people politically who will suggest that the actions Israel is currently taking are somehow the manifestation of a right-wing government. Israel currently does not have a quote-unquote right-wing government. They have a unity government that includes the opposition. In any case, Yov Gallant was urging in the very early days of the war that Israel should turn north, and instead of hitting Hamas, they should actually take the opportunity to knock Hezbollah out, because Hezbollah is significantly more dangerous to the existence of the state of Israel than Hamas. I actually agree with that. Uh, as, as far as what Israel has been doing wrong in the actual war, I mean, I think that, again, from an American perspective, I think that Israel is, is doing pretty well. From an Israeli perspective, if I were Israeli, I would actually want Israel to be less loose about sending its soldiers in on the ground level. So Israel's attempting to minimize civilian casualties, and the cost of that has been the highest military death toll that Israel has had since the 1973 Yom Kippur War. I mean, I personally know 
through one degree of separation, three separate people have been killed in Gaza. And that's because they're going in door to door. It's because they're they're attempting to minimize civilian casualties, and they're losing a lot of guys in in this particular in this particular war. Um, you know, the, the the problem that Israel has had, historically speaking, is that Israel got very complacent about its own security situation. They believed the technology was going to somehow correct for the hatred on the other side of the wall that the very, okay, so our people have to live underground for two weeks at a time while some rockets fall, but at least it's not a war. And that complacence, you know, bred what happened on October 7th. So the, to, to me, what Israel did wrong was years and years and years of complacence and belief in an Oslo system that is at root a failure because you cannot make a peace agreement with people who do not want to make peace with you. Uh, so that, that that's what I think Israel is doing wrong. I, I have a feeling that there's going to be wide divergence on this point. Um, maybe. Uh, so, uh, in terms of broadly speaking, uh, I generally oppose settlement expansion is a thing that Israel does incorrectly that I think is kind of like provocative to at least all the Palestinians, uh, in the West Bank. And I probably energizes hatred in the uh, Gaza Strip for them as well. In terms of conducting, uh, in terms of conducting warfare, uh, the one thing that I always say to everybody, uh, especially Americans is you can't evaluate things from an American perspective. It's very stupid. It happened a lot with Ukraine where people are like, oh, well, didn't they work with the Nazis and like, weren't the Soviets the good guys? And it's like, well, in, in other parts of the world, it's not quite as simple. Uh, um, and I think the same is true for Israel-Palestine, that a lot of Americans will analyze the conflict as just being one between only Israel and Palestine, which it's not. It's a conflict between Israel and then Palestine, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and Iran. Right now it is. Um, I think that the, however, one area where I'll break with Ben is, is I think that minimizing civilian casualties and everything is very, very, very important. I think on the Israeli side, I don't think it's important so that the U.S. will stay with them, because I think the U.S. is probably going to stick with Israel as long as they don't do anything crazy. And I don't even think it matters for the international community. It doesn't, definitely doesn't matter for the U.N., because <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, however, I think it's really, really, really important that I think that in the Middle East, broadly speaking, I think that leadership, especially in the Gulf, has gotten over the Palestinian uh, issue. I think that leadership is kind of like, they don't care as much anymore. But the populations still care quite a bit. And I think that the main issue that Israel could run into is if the civilian death toll does climb too high, and if they start to hit this you know, 40, 50, 60,000 number of civilian casualties, they run the risk of the civilian populations in the surrounding Middle Eastern states becoming so antagonistic towards Israel that they start to take steps back towards normalization in the region. So for instance, I know that um, Bahrain, I think, already pulled out their ambassador um, to Israel. My guess is going to be it's temporary. Um, I know that on the... Um, on the public speaking side, you've got a lot of people condemning Israel for the attacks. And on the private side, you've got people telling Israel, please kill all of Hamas because this is untenable and nobody wants to work in this situation. Um, I don't know if this ended up being true or not. I'm guessing it didn't. But I saw on a couple of Twitter accounts, it was leaked that potentially Saudi Arabia was considering installing a government in the West Bank that they would run. Um, uh, no, I mean, I, I think Israel would love nothing better than that. But that is for not sure. Yeah. Saudi, okay. One of the big problems in the Middle East is literally no one wants to preside over the Palestinians. Yes. No one. So the I Arab think that, states, Israel, no one. No. <laughs> no so one. I think the issue is, and, and I think, and I'm largely actually, I'm very sympathetic towards the Palestinians because I think that for, um, since 48 and onwards, I think that all of the Arab states super gassed them up on that. They wanted the Palestinians to fight because they wanted to fight with Israel. Um, however, as time has gone on and they realize that the, it's kind of a lost cause, states have started to drop out. So you're getting these bilateral uh, peace treaties with um Egypt and with Jordan, you're getting multilateral agreements like the Abraham Accords. And now the Palestinians are looking around. I'm like, okay, well, you guys told us to fight all this time. And now the only people that we have supporting us are Iranian proxies. Um, so the Palestinians are in a very weird spot where they've like lost all their support. Um, yeah, I think that I think that Israel, what I would say to be quote unquote critical of Israel is Israel needs to take strong steps towards peace that probably involves them enduring some undue hardship. So not the October 7th attacks, because Jesus, that's way too much. But, you know, other types of, you know, attacks that they might have to deal with that might cause some civilians to die that they don't come out over the top with and and retaliate with if there's ever going to be peace in that region. However, the, another thing that I've always said is a huge problem between Israel and Palestine is I think that both sides think that if they continue to fight, it will be good for them. But the problem is one side is delusional. <laughs> uh, Israel, I think Israel wants to continue to fight because they get justifications for uh, the annexation of the Golan Heights. They get justifications for expansions, especially in Area C that I that think they're probably going to try to annex soon. Uh, they get justifications for the increased military posturing uh, towards the Gaza Strip and the embargoes. And Israel is right that if the conflict continues, really the situation only improves for Israel over time. But the Palestinians also all believe that if they keep fighting, they thought this since 2000 under Arafat, that if they just keep fighting 
think they'll get better gains too, but that's not the case. Is there a difference between Palestinian citizens and the leadership when you say that? I love all people. I love all people around the world. And I think that when we analyze issues, I think that we have to be very honest with what the people on the ground think. And the idea that Hamas is just this one-off thing in the Gaza Strip is not only incorrect with the situation on the ground, it's also incredibly ahistorical. Um, and the idea that like the Palestinians in the West Bank, of which I believe the most recent polling shows, I want to say 75 to 80% 80. support the October 7th attacks, um, Palestinians in general want to fight in violent conflict with Israel. That's not just the position of the government. That's not just people. There's a reason why Abbas doesn't want to do uh, elections in the West Bank, uh, and it's because the Palestinian people really do want to fight with Israel. But to combat that problem is like, you have to get the UN on board. We've got to do an actual addressing of the Palestinian refugee problem, which is handled like a joke right now. Um, Iran has to be brought to the table in terms of negotiations. Uh, there has to be huge efforts made to economically revitalize these like Palestinian areas, even though they're one of the highest recipients of aid in the world. Um, you, you have to do something about the embargo and the blockade in the Gaza Strip, which isn't just maintained by Israel. It's also maintained by Egypt. You should ask why. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things that have to happen to fix that problem. But the reality is, is I don't think Israel really wants to because they get to continue their expansion into the West Bank. And I don't think anybody around the world really cares that much. So in a month, we won't be talking about I will argue with that. The yeah. idea that Israel does not want to end the conflict is belied by the history of what just happened with the Gaza Strip. So when we talk about settlements, for example, Israel did have settlements inside the Gaza Strip. There were 8,000 Jews who were living inside the Gaza Strip in Gush Katif uh, up until 2005. They, they, they withdrew all of those people. I mean, took them literally out of their homes. Uh, and the result was not the burgeoning of a of a better attitude toward the state of Israel with regard to, for example, you know, the, the Palestinian population in Gaza. In fact, it was more radical in Gaza than it was in the West Bank. Uh, the 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 result was obviously the election of Hamas, the the October 7th attacks in which, unfortunately, many civilians took place, uh, took part in the October 7th attacks. There's video of people rushing who are civilians and dressed in civilian clothing into uh, Israeli oh, villages. Not always the same thing. <laughs> well, no, no, that is that is one hundred percent true. Obviously, uh, and when it comes to you know Area C and Israel's you know supposed deep and abiding desire for territorial expansion in Area C, Area C. So for for those who are not familiar with the Oslo Accords, and again, this is getting very abstruse, but the Oslo Accords are broken down into three areas of the West Bank. Area A is under full Palestinian control. That'd be like Janine and Nablus, the the major cities, for example. There's Area B, which is mixed Israeli Palestinian control, where Israel provides. Uh, some level of military security and control. Uh, and then there's Area C. And Area C was like to be decided later. It was left up for possible concessions to the Palestinian Authority if the Oslo Accords had moved forward. Those are disputed territories. There is building taking place in Area C by both, actually, no one talks about this, but by, by Palestinians as well as Israelis. Uh, and the the you know question as to whether if Israel stopped building, there have been many settlement freezes in the past, including some undertaken by Netanyahu. Netanyahu uh, and, and it actually has not done one iota of good in moving the ball forward in terms of actual negotiations. Again, the, the biggest problem is that the leadership for Palestinians has spent every day since really 67, it's not even 48, because after 40, between 48 and 67, Jordan was in charge of the West Bank and Egypt was in charge of the Gaza Strip. And at no point did either of those powers say, hey, maybe we ought to hand this over to an independent Palestinian state, which was originally the division that was, that was promoted by the UN partition plan in 47. The, because of that, uh, the the leadership post-67 and really starting in 64, the Palestine Liberation Organization was founded in 64, and it called for the liberation of the land. In 64, they had the West Bank and they had the Gaza Strip. So they're talking about Tel Aviv. Uh, when it was founded in, in 64, the basic idea, as you know, kind of indicated by that, was Israel will not exist. And that was a promise that's been made by pretty much every Palestinian leader in Arabic to the people that they are talking to. Yasser Arafat famously would do this sort of thing. He'd speak in English and talk about how he wanted a two-state solution, and then he'd go back to his own people and say, this is a Trojan horse. And we're gonna... If Israel could, if you think that Israeli parents want to send their kids at the age of 18 to go and monitor Janine and Nablus and be in, in Khan Yunus, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. Israelis do not want that. In fact, Israelis didn't want that so much that they allowed rockets to fall in their cities for full on 18 years in order to avoid sending soldiers en masse back into the Gaza Strip. True, but I think Israel does want to continue to expand settlements into the West Bank, right? They want to continue to build. They want to have the, okay, all so, of Jerusalem, East Jerusalem as well. Well, I mean, East Jerusalem has already been annexed. So East Jerusalem is, according to Israel, a part of Israel. That's not a settlement. Sure. Okay, so there, there's that. With, with regard to 
you know, does Israel have an interest in expanding settlements in the West Bank? What, why would they not until there's a peace partner? Sure, that's Meaning, what like, I mean. For, but I'm saying as long as the conflict continues, like, because even when you talk no, but about you, what, the- you, but No, but your suggestion is that they're incentivizing the conflict to continue so they can grab more land. Well, no, let me but be I, very clear. I don't yeah. think there's like a plan. Like, so some people say, for instance, uh, they'll take that one quote from Netanyahu and they'll try to say that like he was funding the people in the Gaza Strip by allowing Qatari money to come in, even though he was actually speaking in opposition to Abbas, allowing the Gaza Strip to fall for Netanyahu to clear it out for him and they give it back, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying, I'm not claiming those theories. I'm just saying that I think that Israel will take a relatively neutral stance towards conflict in enduring because as long as the conflict endures and as long as the uh, settlements can expand, I think that benefits, I think that ultimately benefits Israel. The, 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 I think there would be very, let, let's put it this way. Uh -huh. If suddenly there arose among the Palestinians a deep and abiding desire for peace approved by a vast majority of the population with serious security guarantees, uh -huh. I think you'd be very hard pressed to find Israelis who would not be willing to at least consider that in return like for not like, expanding bathrooms in Efrat. I kind of, agree, I would have agreed with you on October 6th. I think we're probably a, a year or two oh, away no, from no, that right now. No, though. no, but, yeah. but no, the, the point I'm making is that Israelis now realize that the entire peace process was a sham, meaning the people who are on the other side of the table were using it as a Trojan horse in the first place. The, the death of Oslo <laughs> is not the death of Israeli hopefulness. It's the death of the illusion that on the other side of the table was anyone worth bargaining with. That's what's happening. And that's why you have this sort of insane disconnect right now between the United States and the Israeli government. Again, it's a unity government. Mm -hmm. No one in Israel is talking about making concessions to the Palestinian Authority for a wide variety of reasons, including the fact that Mahmoud Abbas's Fatah continues to pay actual families of terrorists who kill Jews. Sure, the market and, fund, yeah. Right, and, and the Which fact, is from the, the moderate West Bank. Right, right exactly. Yeah. That's the, the, so, you know, again, like, the, the taste in Israel for this is a... If, even the people who are the, the Chilonim, right? Those are the most secular people in Israel, mm -hmm. which was, by the way, the, the place that was attacked on October 7th. I mean, what people should understand is that October 7th was not an attack against settlements in the West Bank. It was an attack on peace villages that were essentially disarmed. And many of these people who were killed were peace activists who were literally trying to work with people in Gaza to get them jobs. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's mind boggling. That's which why is, you've had this ground shift in Israel. The next 20 years in Israel is going to be about security and economic development, period, end of story. Everything else goes second, third place. And I will say, I agree essentially with everything you're saying, um, not to loop back on another topic, but this is one of the reasons then why I was so critical. I don't want to say critical, but like kind of nonchalant about the Abraham Accords because they didn't address anything with the Palestinians whatsoever. They brought no, in countries that weren't super relevant to the conflict. They didn't bring in Qatar, which is where a lot of the money and support for the Gaza Strip comes from. They didn't involve Iran at all. They involved bilateral. No, but it totally changed the mentality. And this is why what, what I'm seeing right mm -hmm. now, this is why, listen, I'm, I think sure. that, that Biden has done better than I certainly expected him to do in terms of support for Israel. Like Obama okay. was way less supportive of Israel for than sure. Biden by every metric. Mm -hmm. With that said, the rhetoric that he's been using recently and that Blanken have been using recently about Israel needs to make painful concessions for peace, Israel recentering mm -hmm. this issue at the center of relations in the Middle East is doomed to failure. The magic, magic is a strong word, the, the benefit of the Abraham Accords was proof of what you're saying, which is true, which is that all of these surrounding countries in reality have abandoned the idea that there's a centrality to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. That is not the central conflict in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And by the way, one of the reasons it's not the central conflict in the Middle East is because actually, ironically, because of the rise of Iran, right? It's, it's Sunni states that are largely signing up with Israel because they're realizing they need some sort of counterweight to a, a burgeoning nuclear power in Iran. Can we talk about Ukraine? Sure. Do you have a not? disagreement with, you, uh, with, with what uh, Destiny said? My, my main problem with Biden's policy with regard to Ukraine is that he outsourced the end goal of the war to Zelensky early on. Now, that might make sense if that goal were something that he was willing to fund to the point of achievement, uh, or if Zelensky could have achieved it on his own. But right now, and this has been true since pretty early on in the war, this point Henry Kissinger made, uh, this is that, that pretty early on in the war, it was very clear that, for example, Crimea was going nowhere. The Russians had control of Crimea, barring the United States, giving permission to fly F-16s over Crimea. Nothing was going to change over there. The same thing was true in most of the Donbass, right, in Luhansk and Donetsk. That, that was not going to change. Zelensky stated goal, and you understand it, he's the leader of Ukraine, right, is, is that there was a predation on his territory in 2014, and that the Russians sent their little green men across the border, and then they took all of these areas. And so he, as the leader of Ukraine, is saying, okay, I want all of that back. Now, the reality is that the U.S.'s interests had largely been achieved in the first few months of the war, meaning the revocation of the ability of Russia to take Ukraine and just ingest it, and two, the devastation of, of Russia's military capability. I mean, Russia has just been wrecked. I mean, their military is in serious straits because of the war in Ukraine. From an American perspective, I'm very much pro all of that. I think that we have an interest in Ukraine maintaining a buffer status against uh, a territorially aggressive Russia. I think that the United States does have an interest in degrading the Russian military to the extent that it can't threaten the Baltic states or threaten 
Kazakhstan or other countries in the region. The problem I have with Biden's strategy is, as always, I think that it's a muddle. And I think muddles tend to end with misperceptions. War tends to break out and maintain because of misperception. Misperception of the other side's strength, the other side's intentions, and, and all of the rest. People misperceive what's going to happen. They say, I'll, I'll cross that line and nothing will happen, right? This is what Putin thought. He thought, I'll cross that line. They will greet me as a liberator. And because the United States just surrendered in Afghanistan, essentially, they won't do anything. And the West is fragmenting because NATO's fragmenting and all the rest of this. And obviously, he was wrong on, on all of those scores. The problem for, for Biden is that as with virtually every war, no end line was set. And so it became out recently, it was widely reported, that actually there was a peace deal that was on the table in the first few months that Putin was on board with uh, that basically would have ceded Luhansk and Donetsk and Crimea to Russia in return for solidification of those lines, American and Western security guarantees to Ukraine, right? Ukraine wouldn't formally join NATO, but there would be security guarantees to Ukraine. We're ending up there anyway. It's just taking a lot more money and a lot more time to get there. And do you think and, Trump would have helped push that peace? Yes. And I think and I think that Biden actually did Zelensky a bit of a disservice because Zelensky knows where this war is going to end. And it's not going to end with Luhansk and Donetsk and Crimea in Ukrainian hands. It's just not going to. And he knows that. What actually, in my opinion, Zelensky needed was for Joe Biden to be the person who foisted that deal upon him so that he could then go back to his own people and say, listen, guys, I wanted all those things. But the Americans weren't willing to allow me to have all those things. And so we did an amazing job. We did a heroic job in defending our own land. We devastated the Russian military, even though no one expected us to. But we can't get back those things because it's unrealistic to get back those things because America basically, they're a big funder and they're the ones who want the deal. Instead, what Biden said, and this was reported in the Washington Post last year, the Biden administration said, we're going to fight for as long as it takes with as much as it takes. And when they were asked until when, they said, whatever Zelensky says. And that's not a policy. That's just a recipe for a frozen conflict with endless funding. Now, it may be that Putin has walked away from the table and that deal is no longer available. If that deal is, is available right now, I certainly hope that's being pursued behind closed doors. My main critique, again, of Biden is that when you outsource the end goal to another country without stating what America's interest is, that's a problem. I also think that Biden did really quite a poor job of sort of explaining what America's realistic interests are. I, I, I don't like it when American leaders um, it's weird for me to say this, but I, I'm not a huge fan of the we're in it to protect democracy kind of rhetoric, because frankly, we are allied with many, many countries that are not democracies, and that's not actually how foreign policy works. Uh, we should, as an overall, you know, 30,000 foot goal, advance democracy and, and rights where we can. But the reason that we were fighting in favor of Ukraine, and when I say fighting, I mean giving them money and giving them weaponry. The reason that we were doing that in favor of Ukraine is not because of Ukraine's long history of clean voting and non-corruption. The reason that we were doing that is to counter Russian interests in the region. I mean, that was, it was a pure real politic play. And that real politic play is hard to deny no matter what side of the aisle you're on. I think that what many Americans are going to, are reverting to is we have no interest there. Why are we spending money there and not spending money here? And that, that kind of stuff. And that, that argument can always be applied unless you actually articulate the reason why it is good for Americans beyond simply the ideological for the United States to be involved in a thing. So for example, I think right now, when when Biden is talking, I think that what Biden just did, he's the United States as we speak, is striking the Houthis. I think that that's a really, really good thing. I think that's a necessary thing. I think American people should understand why that is happening. It's not because of quote unquote ideology. Mm -hmm. It is, I mean, on a, on a very root level, but really it's because you're you're screwing up the straits. I mean, you can't, you can't do that. You yeah. can't screw up free trade. And Americans have an interest in not seeing all of our prices at the grocery store double and triple because a bunch of ragtag pirates, you know, akin to the, the Barbary pirates from 1800 are, are bothering everyone, right? So Ben said a lot there. Do you disagree with any aspect on the Ukraine side? The um, side? A little bit, yeah. Um, I, I think on the macro, I agree. Maybe we get into the weasel a little bit on some things. I, on the final thing that he said, though, I wish that Americans could have honest conversations about foreign policy. I think that it would just be better for everybody. Um, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, Red Scare after the Cold War, where it was like literally, you know, the behemoths, you know, were fighting against communism. And we felt like after 91, every single foreign policy decision needs to be able to be explained in like seven words, like he's the bad guy and that's it. Um, I wish we had more honest conversations about uh, what our foreign policy interest is in a particular region, because I don't think most Americans honestly could even 
even articulate why Israel would be an important ally or why it's important to defend Ukraine against Russia or why should we care about Taiwan at all. I don't know if most Americans could articulate anything there, um, even though they might have very strong opinions about why uh, we ought to be involved in certain conflicts. So I do agree with that. I wish we had more honest conversations about uh, foreign policy. Um, in terms of how Biden has handled Ukraine, my, the things that I liked the most were, one, that he was very clear in the beginning about what we wouldn't do. So Biden saying that we're not going to do... Um, uh, not a red line, no fly zones over Ukraine. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be deploying troops on the ground in Ukraine. We're not going to be doing anything that would have, you know, U.S. soldiers and Russian soldiers crossing swords with each other. That's not going to happen. I like that he made that very clear at the beginning. Um, and I like that he coalition built between NATO and the EU to get people to send uh, funds, training, soldiers, airplanes and everything to Ukraine. I thought those two things were really good. In terms of basically writing Zelensky a blank check, I would like to hope that Biden and the entire United States learned a lesson from Iraq and Afghanistan that open-ended missions with unlimited budgets and no clear goal are like the worst foreign policy decisions you can ever do. They've like defined U.S. foreign policy for the past two or three decades, which is unfortunate, but seems to be the case. Um, my my feeling would be, and this is just a feeling, I don't know if internal cables have leaked that say otherwise, is the uh, the Biden administration has probably always had a quiet position of at some point there's going to be an off-ramp here. And I think even a month or two ago, I think those talks were being leaked, that discussion had begun with Zelensky looking for an off-ramp. But publicly, of course, the United States is never going to come out and say, we are going to support you guys to fight as much as you want for three months. And then after that, it's no more. Obviously, that can't be the statement. It's always going to be that we're going to support you in your fight against Russia. Yeah, we tried that under Obama with Afghanistan. It was terrible. <clears throat> sure. Way. Yeah, you, you can't. We'll you escalate can't. the troop levels to X, but only for six months, and then we're. Yeah, you out. can't. You just can't do that. It's always going to come off as we're going to support you forever and as long as it takes and as long as you need whatever we have to do to defend freedom and democracy in your country. And any any other statement would be absurd. So I can understand why it feels like on a public level a blank check and an indefinite time period was granted to Zelensky, but I don't think that's going to be the case. I think I again I hope. We've learned our lessons in the Middle East about the forever wars, that this isn't going to be a forever funding to Ukraine to fight for as long as they want. Um, I do disagree. I feel like we're playing a little bit retrospectively, saying that, like, well, it's obvious that they're not going to capture the Donbass. It's obvious that they're not going to capture Crimea. I agree for Crimea, that was incredibly obvious. But it was also really obvious that in two weeks, Russia would own Kiev and Ukraine was going to be Belarus 2.0. I think that e even for a lot of uh, military people, um, and analysts around the world, uh, that that, that was a, an expectation, or at least a significant probability. Nobody knew, uh, the, the phrase that's thrown around now is paper tiger, that Russia's military was as ill-equipped as they were. So I can understand why, especially if you're Ukraine, and if you've repelled an invasion from one of the world's largest armies, why you might feel like, well, fuck it, you know, let's fight for a few months, let's fight for a year, let's see what happens. And I can understand the United States supporting them, but I agree that there has to be some reasonable off-ramp, but we're not going to fight forever. I think the U.S. Um, State Department has already begun those conversations with Zelensky to look at what that off-ramp looks like. Um, but yeah, I'm not too sure. Other than like explicitly stating publicly, like you can only fight until this date. I don't really know what else I would change. I, I don't think the, I don't think the Biden administration should have done that. I don't, I don't know what else. Should, do you think Biden should, should cut this deal on uh, on the funding? Meaning there's like six, there's this $105 billion deal that's been held up by debate between Republicans and Democrats over border, right? So basically it contains $60 billion for Ukraine, $14 billion for Israel, another several billion dollars for Taiwanese defense against China, and then includes some border funding and some border provisions. Republicans mm -hmm. want the border funding and the border provisions because we can get into the illegal immigration issue, but that's mm -hmm. a pretty serious issue. And Biden and Democrats have been unwilling to hold that up. And that, that, that seems to me like just from put aside Republican Democrats, it seems like political malpractice, meaning there's a widespread perception in the United States that the border is a disaster area. Joe Biden wants these things. Many Republicans don't want these things. If he caves on the border stuff, he gets all the things that he wants, and he's going to be able to go back to the moderates in the country and say, I did something about the border. It seems like such an obvious win. I'm, if he caves on the border stuff, you mean on the Ukraine stuff? Yes, because then he gets yeah. the whole package, sure, meaning yeah. he, can, he can go back to his own base and he can say, <sighs> listen, guys, I wanted to I wanted to be easy on the border. The Republicans forced me to it, but we needed the Ukraine aid. We needed the Taiwan aid, right? Yeah. I mean, like that's you're honestly, you're going to be more educated than me on this. I don't like, uh, or maybe maybe I just don't know enough. I don't like the principle that when we negotiate things in the United States, there's like 50 million hostages at all points in time for every single thing. Like, oh boy, here comes the debt ceiling. What do the Republicans want? What do the Democrats want? Oh boy, like here, you know, we can't fund our government. Um, but I mean, obviously the the argument is going to be that if the Ukraine funding doesn't come in this bill, and if Biden and his administration feel like it's really important that unilaterally, or not unilaterally, but as a single issue, it's not going to pass. So um, I, I would say that at this point, 
And I don't know what the conversations look like between the Biden administration and Zelensky. I would say at this point that it's probably fair to start making contingencies on the money that we give to Ukraine that, listen, like this uh, conflict has, you know, waged on now. Like now we need to start looking for potential peace. We can't just write you an unlimited check. So, I mean, if those strings are attached, I'd be okay with it. But the broader question of like, is it okay to make this particular piece of legislation with all this funding contingent on uh, the Ukrainian funding? I mean, that just seems to be the way the government works now, unfortunately.